okay we're going to go live and then we'll start in about i guess about 30 seconds or so so yeah um i think we are already live so uh Hello everybody, um, welcome back to another uh, edition of our Quarantine Thermo Seminar Series. Um, so let me just, before I introduce the speaker, let me just make a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, um, please do continue to spread the word to everybody, uh, your colleagues and your students and so on, get them to sign up to the mailing list. Um, we have quite a lot of very exciting speakers lined up for the next few weeks, which you can check out in the calendar. Um, but we do still, of course, need more speakers. So if you are keen to give a presentation uh, or if you know of someone that you'd like to hear speak, um, please get in touch with me and uh, I'll see if I can and sort it out. Um, so seems like the stream is looking good. Um, so let me, without further ado, introduce um, Professor Andrew Jordan. We're really happy to have him here um, from the University of Rochester virtually here of course um but it's the best we can manage so um uh, i mean amongst many other things andrew is an expert in nanophysics in quantum transport uh, quantum information um a non-exhaustive list but um, in particular he's an expert also in measurements which is very fortuitous because this week's uh, completely accidental theme turned out to be measurements in quantum thermodynamics and so andrew's going to tell us about uh, quantum measurement powered engines so please go ahead, Andrew, if you can share your screen. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, let me see if I can get my screen up here. Just a moment. Uh, okay, how's that? Let's see. Let's pull up my... Can you see my slides? Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, hello everyone. I wanted to greet all of my uh, friends and colleagues. Let me see if I can minimize this. Oh, very good. Very good. So I wanted to say hi to all my friends and colleagues from around the world. So thank you for, for tuning in. It's a pleasure to be here. So, so thank you so much, Mark, for hosting this. And thank you also to John for organizing this series of seminars out of Dublin. So this has been really great. I, I've been watching several of these talks and I've been really excited to see this initiative. So I'm happy to be invited to speak here in this forum. And I wanted to talk to you today about some quantum measurement powered engines. Uh, and so that's the theme of my talk, but, but um, in this time of our stay-at-home orders here in New York anyway, uh, one of the things my, my wife says she misses the most is small talk. So to go out and say, hello, how are you? Uh, how's it going? She doesn't get to do that anymore. So I wanted to kind of break the ice in my talk this morning by just having a little bit, a few minutes of, of quarantine uh, small talk. Uh, so, so let me just first of all say, yes, yeah, so I'm from the University of Rochester in New York. Uh, and a lot of this work is also supported by the Department of Energy. And many of the works I'll be talking about now uh, were started uh, at, at when I was in California a couple of years ago at a nice conference we had, or rather program, at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. And so that's our little logo here. I think you can see my cursor. So that's my little logo here uh, from our KITP time. And so I wanted to uh, just start by mentioning a few things. So first of all, where is Rochester? So I know most of this audience from looking at the previous talks in the chat, most of these, uh, most of you are from uh, Europe somewhere or, or in the neighborhood. So maybe you're not so polished up on your U.S. geography. So I wanted to give you a little geography lesson to begin with. Uh, so first of all, I'm sitting in New York State. And, and so usually when you when you say New York, people mean New York City. But if you look down here, this is where New York City is. But we're nowhere close to New York City. We're way up here in in Rochester, which is just on the on the southern uh, uh, southern coast of Lake Ontario. So very very far away. Uh, but nevertheless, New York. So New York is a very big state, and, and so and so that's where I'm I'm sitting now. And that's where I've been sitting uh, for the past uh, month uh, going on uh, in my and mostly in my in my home. So uh, in uh, I think I was I was watching Ronnie Kozlov's talk a few days ago. 
And he had this nice picture of him saying, well, yes, we're in quarantine here in Jerusalem, but maybe it's not so bad because I can sit out on my beautiful sunny deck and have a drink. And he had a most nice picture of him smiling and having a, a drink on his deck in the sunshine. So I wanted to give you my, my version of that of that slide. Uh, and so here is my version of that slide. Uh, this, this is uh, this week here in Rochester, looking out my bedroom window, you can see uh, things are not quite so sunny and warm here in Rochester. And indeed, I wish I could tell you that this was a kind of a fluke. Uh, but unfortunately, I think on most days this week, we've had some snowflakes in the air. So, so, so being stuck at home and not be able to go to meetings and not really be able to go outside to have a nice walk uh, without bundling up has been quite a quite a chore. OK. But nevertheless, we have to be thankful for our blessings. So despite all that, I can have I'm happy to say that we're all healthy and well and trying to stay that way. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's so far so good. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, a little bit about the scientific ramifications of, of this, uh, the virus. And so I thought it would be interesting to think about looking at my sharing my diary with you about the, the conferences I was supposed to go to, but, but was not able to go to <laughs> yes of this. Uh, so, so the first one, of course, I think many of you probably wanted to go to this, uh, American Physical Society meeting. This was in Denver, Colorado this year. And uh, I had my whole group set to go. We had our tickets bought. We had a nice uh, a nice Airbnb for the whole group booked in Denver. And I think the night before we were supposed to get on the plane to go to Denver, we got the notice that the whole meeting had been canceled. So 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 many thousands of physicists uh, having to cancel their their travel. But that was only the beginning, right? So, so, so I think I was going to see many of you uh, at this nice conference that was planned in Toulouse about shortcuts to adiabaticity. That would be the next week in March. And of course, that was canceled. Then a seminar at Chapman in Orange, California, I was supposed to go give. That was canceled. Then a meeting in Michigan in May, I'm, I, I'm supposed to go to. That was canceled. Another meeting in, in Telluride I was in July, canceled. My, my quantum strangeness class I give to high school students, canceled. My PA meeting, okay, I mean, that's not so bad that that's canceled, but so be it. And then the other sort of one of our personal ramifications of this lockdown has been that my postdoc, uh, Cyril, Cyril, Cyril L. Ward, he was over in France interviewing for a job when, when uh, our government decided to stop all European air travel <laughs> to the United States. And so he, the poor guy was, was stuck over there. But, but luckily, that's his home country. And so he was able to go to his parents and his wife was able to join him. So that ended up being OK, but still enormous, an enormous disruption. OK, so that I think so that's a little bit of a taste of I know my scientific disruption for the next uh, for the past month and the next six months. But I'm sure you all have similar stories to tell about uh, about the impact of this uh, virus and, and its uh, societal impact. All right. So I wanted to next go. I wanted to give a plug for a journal. So 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 uh, I'm I'm now effectively the editor in chief of this journal, Quantum Studies, Mathematics and Foundations. And this is a journal relatively new. It's organized by my friends at Chapman University in Orange in Orange County. And they've asked me to take over the editorial function for for the physics side of it, of the journal anyway. And mostly the focus has been on foundational issues, so foundations of quantum mechanics, mathematical issues. But I'm very keen to try to broaden the scope of this journal. And so um, I wanted to welcome, especially for the younger contributors uh, 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 that are listening in, uh, talks or papers about quantum thermodynamics. We'd be, I'd be very happy to receive su submissions for that and to publish quantum thermodynamics papers uh, in this journal as well. And the thing I like about it, it's a smaller journal, it's more specialized, but it doesn't have, the way I run it anyway, you don't have to worry about the third report from referee C uh, trying to respond to it. Uh, so so, so I, 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 I try to have a policy that if it's a quality paper, it's really good paper, then I try to find a way to get it, to get it published. Um, and so I want to just encourage you to, to submit, submit to it and, uh, and, and I'm happy to, and if, and if you want to ask me a question about it, please send me an email. I'm happy to, to correspond about it. Okay. So let, let's go on now into sort of the, the structure of the talk that I wanted to, to present to you today. 
I wanted to sort of warm up with with my take on the field. So what do I view? How do I think about quantum thermodynamics as, uh, thermodynamics as a field as it's be, as it's developed over the past uh, you know few decades? Really, has taken off in the past five. To, I would say five years. Really, has really taken off in terms of a huge amount of interest uh, and many people working in it. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of my work on thermal quantum thermal machines, but then have that as a segue to bit to build into some of our new work on the interplay between energy energy and quantum measurement. And thinking about uh, the physics, uh, the, some of the unique physics of quantum mechanics, in particular regarding measurement and how the wave function collapses, and its role with the knowledge of the observer to try to then build new, really qualitatively new kinds of engines that harness the physics of quantum mechanics. Okay, and so I want to I want to introduce the basic idea and then build up with a series of simple examples. So starting with the simplest uh, qubit engine. And then talk about various uh, uh, other more complicated ideas. So, so we have this nice uh, elevator that we've designed. I'll tell you about our quantum elevator to lift things, really, really small things like atoms. I'll talk to you about uh, an example of, of, a, of a piston in an atom. Uh, so basically like a, a single atom ideal gas, but, but using but a quant, really a fundamentally quantum version of that. And then the, those two engines, or three engines, will all involve using the knowledge obtained by the observer. So, so I do an experiment, I, I do a measurement, I, I have some apparatus, I read the apparatus, and then I go and do something conditionally based on what I get. Okay, and so then I want to try dive into this question of do I have to do that? Do I have to have information-driven engines, so an information as fuel, so to speak? Or can I do some kind of autonomous engine where I don't have to, I could I could I could do the measurement, but I don't have to look at it. I can just do 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 and not have to look and then act or react. And then finally, I want to end with something that I am really kind of tickled by, and I think I hope you'll enjoy it too, which is a new type of uh, what we call interaction-free measurement engines that I'll tell you about uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so I want to I want to also thank all my collaborators on the type of work that I'll be talking about today. This is by no means an exhaustive list of pe the people I work with, but these are the people whose contributions and thinking has touched on the work I'll be presenting to you today. So, so I want to particularly pull out that my my uh, group members that are working on this. So Cyril uh, Elward, who's been really a, a powerhouse in this field. Uh, together with with G with Jean and Srinath, my my PhD students, and then of course all my other uh, uh, faculty colleagues uh, around the world, they've been really great. And I particularly want to call out uh, Rafa and Bjorn, who who've been working with me on these kind of topics for many years now, and so I've really appreciated that collaboration. Okay, so but all thanks to all these folks. Okay, so so I wanted to begin with with some uh, review of, of some of my work on quantum thermal machines. Um, and so this has been something we've been working on for many years. So I started working on this uh, uh, with Marcus Boudicker in Geneva uh, as a, really after I'd finished my time as a postdoc and coming back as a, as a visitor there. I then got to be working with several of his postdocs and students at the time. Uh, and, then we, and then over the years, we published a number of papers on this kind of quantum thermal machines, doing all kinds of things. So, so using mesoscopic physics to rectify current, to, to build very sensitive thermometers, uh, at, at using single electron type transport experiments, looking at designing and optimizing quantum heat engines, trying to optimize the power and efficiency of these engines, looking at uh, you know, designing them with quantum wells, looking at novel physics of the quantum Hall effect, how that can separate the Peltier effect from the Seebeck effect, and then trying to scale these devices up with uh, self-assembled quantum dots uh, is one example, using super lattices uh, as another example, and then most recently looking at um, scaled up types of refrigerators. So for example, utilizing the the phase transition between the normal and the superconducting phase uh, as the, really the, the latent heat power to drive a refrigeration uh, cycle uh, using layered uh, 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 superconducting and metallic uh, uh, materials. 
So, so over the years, yes, so we've been trying to work on these various types of engines, and, and indeed, I, I plan to continue doing this kind of physics. It's very interesting from the point of view of thermal electricity, of trying to then drive uh, electrical current based on some uh, temperature imbalance. And it also has important societal impacts in terms of trying to harvest wasted energy. And most of our electronics is very lossy in terms of heat wasted. So seeing if we could try to harvest some of that, to, 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 to recycle some of that uh, heat back into power. And then many other interesting applications along those lines. Okay, but I wanted to talk a little bit about my vision of this, and, and to introduce that, I wanted to say, I, you know, so I mentioned I, I was watching Ronnie's talk the other day. Oh, yeah, so I also want to mention the, the thing I like about this field is that it's really now it's becoming really closely connected to experiments. So, so, so there have been some really nice experiments, for example, in Yucopecula's group on uh, superconducting uh, qubit type uh, realizations of heat engines and various other, the type of things I just discussed on the previous slide. But here are two other papers a few years ago that are that are being able to realize some of these ideas in the laboratory. That's something that I've always really appreciated in being in this field is having having theories that can be tested <coughs> and also be useful to experimentalists as they design new types of uh, devices uh, that are working at the nanoscale in order to you know to, to 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 leverage our understanding of how quantum physics works and how thermodynamics works uh, on this uh, very small link scale so that that's been really exciting for me to see and i hope that continues uh, in the near future okay uh and so here are some of the papers so i just wanted to give you kind of a flavor of some of the things we've been doing in my group over just the past year or two uh, so, so most of these papers were started uh, at the KITP in Santa Barbara, but, but more generally in my sabbatical year a couple of years ago in California. And so we have a bunch of papers that have come out from that, and, and you see them here. And they're not done. We're still working on things that, that I started two years ago. Uh, and so please, please, uh, please uh, keep an eye out for, for, for new works uh, that are that are that are coming out. So just to show that this is a very active. Uh, area of research in my in my group, and I know uh, all of you are working on this field as well. All right. <clears throat> so, so I, I um, here is my view of the field. So I was watching. Uh, so I watched Ronnie's talk the other day, and that was really great. And I also watched Nicole Younger Halperin's talk, and she didn't mention, I don't think, in her talk, this this sort of uh, uh, catchphrase that she's coined quantum steampunk, uh, but, but I wanted to mention this kind of funny expression to you because it, it flashed up on my Google News uh, feed the other day, <coughs> excuse me. So yes, so, so Google News has figured out that I like quantum things, and so they've they sort of created a subcategory of my news feed that's devoted to quantum things. And so that's how I learned, for example, the other day that John Martinez resigned from Google. I was kind of shocked to hear this. But one of my other news items was uh, was I found that that um, Nicole had a very nice paper that she published in Scientific American, I think I think just about a week ago. And if you don't know what Scientific American it's, is, it's sort of a popular journal in the U.S. Uh, that that uh, takes scientific fields and sort of writes it in a way that's accessible to everyone. Uh, and so she had a nice so congratulations Nicole for this nice article. Uh, it's important to to congratulate each other for 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 good for good work. Uh, and I kind of thought about this term, and I first of all I had to figure out what steampunk is because if you're like me, all of my popular uh, culture knowledge comes through my wife, and so I so I have to have some help on these things. So so I looked at looked it up at all the definitive authority on all such topics, which is of course Wikipedia, to define what steampunk is. And so so this is kind of fun. So it, it defines it as a retrofuturist subgenre of science fiction or science fantasy that incorporates technology and aesthetic designs inspired by 19th century industrial steam-powered machinery. Okay, so so essentially it's kind of a synthesis then between old technology and new technology is another way of, of saying it. And uh, and my favorite quote from this article is is given here: "Superficially, steampunk may resemble retrofuturism." Uh, so that sounds like some of my more exotic uh, quantum mechanics work there, retrofuturism. Anyway, 
so, so um, but but I, I think this 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 um, way of putting it gets to gets to one of the points I've been making for a long time, and I want to try to make it here as well. That our field quantum thermodynamics is kind of kind of strange in a way. Why? Because we take these really fancy uh, uh, the latest technology, right? These quantum, for example, superconducting circuits. The, our most advanced scientific uh, knowledge, and what do we do to them? Well, we, we, we put a flame under them, or we put them next to some ice cube, right? So, so we have some of the most advanced kind of science with the most primitive kind of science together acting in one thing. And on the one hand, I, and I love this uh, conceptually, right? It, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. But it's also kind of, uh, if you think about thermodynamic resources, they're really a very crude resource. It's the simplest kind of energy resource you can think of. Uh, and I think it, it's indeed it's good that we continue to work on this, but I'd also like to try to, in a way, move beyond this kind of uh, physics as well. So, 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 so just to be clear, um, I think this is a good thing, and, I, and obviously I'm continuing to work on it, but I want to try to denote, to devote the rest of my talk to trying to move beyond it. So if you look at some examples of... Um, of this, uh, what, 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 what this, this, quant this, this steampunk technology. One of the nice examples they give is Captain Nemo's submarine in Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. And if you and if you read, uh, you know, Jules Verne or you watch the Disney version of this, it captures it really well because it's it's a futuristic thing, right? <coughs> it's it's the submarine that can. Um, that can go 20,000 leagues in the sea, and it's, and it's very advanced in its own way, but it's powered by this some rather primitive technology, which is steam engines, okay? And so I'd like to try to see our field go from this kind of Captain Nemo submarine into some kind of uh, other machine, which I've, I've given that schematically over here on the right. And I stole this from some kind of crazy NASA site that, that that gives you that gives you some kind of make believe warp warp drive engine that they're supposed to be testing, and and the point there is is not to take that seriously, <clears throat> except to take it seriously, which is what I mean by that is to think try to think big about this right. So I want to, I want us as a field to be dreaming about new kinds of crazy quantum engines that don't exist, but we should be inventing them. And so I want to take a small step in that direction by trying to invent for you or tell you about some of our inventions about these crazy quantum engines that, that don't run on uh, a flame or, or burning coal, but have another kind of uh, more ordered, so to speak, energy source. And that is, I want, I want our quantum technology to have really a precise control over the mastery of energy, to be able to make it flow, to be able to quantify it, to understand it, to be able to act on it. And so I want quantum, te quantum technology to be a bigger thing than just quantum uh, factoring of large numbers. I want quantum technology to try to be bigger, and I want it to incorporate precise control of energy. So I want us to get, I, you know, I love quantum information, and indeed that's really revolutionized our understanding of quantum mechanics, but I want to bring it back more towards physics. Uh, I want to broaden that bubble to have more physics involved in this quantum technology field. Okay, so what I want to do in the rest of my talk is try to get away from the thermal baths as, most as, I, as much as I can. I want to throw away that Boltzmann constant, and I want to try to focus on that h-bar. So here we go. So uh, the, I'm telling you about these quantum measurement power engines. So, so quantum, when we have quantum measurements in the sample or in, in, the, uh, in the physics, we learn that th this is the only way we can actually gain information about the quantum system. So this is really our touchstone with reality is the results of measurements. But we also know that, fr that from a fundamental point of view, that these measurements can randomly perturb the state of the quantum particle. So we can't predict the outcomes of the measurements un unless, it's very unless it's a very special situation. But we can predict, once we get the measurement, how the quantum state changes 
uh, from from this uh, from this uh, active measurement. Okay, and so from the point of view, I would say of I was and I want to say I want to replace quantum thermodynamics with quantum energetics. Um, we want to also think about this as the measurement may, may also randomly change the energy of a quantum particle or system. Okay, and that random change has at least a superficial similarity to heat, and, and so so Alexei Ofev, my collaborator, likes to call this quantum heat. And so the, the, the idea then now is can we design some kind of engine in order to be able to extract this energy as useful work to be able to, to fuel our machine, so to speak, uh, based on these uh, energetic fluctuations. So here's a schematic of the, of the kind of systems I'm interested to talk to you about. We have a quantum system represented by the atom. We have the measurement apparatus that acts upon it, <coughs> gaining information, but also, in principle, giving it energy or taking energy from it. If it gives energy, then we have a way of extracting that energy. So I've, I've, I've illustrated that as a kind of a squished atom there. Uh, we want to then extract the energy from that squished atom as useful work and then somehow reset it back to its operating condition, and that's the engine cycle. Okay, so that's the kind of schema that we'll, I'll be talking about. And one interesting thing to say is that is that unless you have that top arrow on the left, you see immediately that would then uh, violate the uh, first law of thermodynamics, so to speak, which is nothing more, of course, than the conservation of energy. So no matter what we have to have, we do have to have conservation of energy. And so if I extract useful work from that uh, squished atom, that means that work has to come from somewhere. And what we'll show in the course of the talk is we have to actually then somehow fuel our measurement apparatus to make this ordered source of energy that's incapable of doing measurements on the quantum system. All right, so I wanna give us the simplest example of this talk, which is that of a qubit. And so if I have a qubit, um, we, we can write it as uh, this Hamiltonian. So it has a ground state and excited state and the energy splitting between those two is epsilon. And the idea now is uh, we want to then be able to do operations uh, on this simplest qubit. And so the operations we can do is well, we can have some kind of preparation scheme we can uh, do uh, unitary operations by coupling it um, with some other Hamiltonian to imp implement unitaries, but we can also implement a dissipation on it. We can couple it to some kind of a dissipative uh, bath, or we can also do measurement on it. We can have a monitored bath to be able to implement uh, measurements as, as, we, as, as we learn in quantum mechanics. So the idea is, uh, if, if I just did my measurement, so if I prepared my little green quantum state there, so let's draw that. So here's my green quantum state, represented on, a, on one portion of the block sphere. If I measured it in the EG basis, what we'll find is that on average, uh, no energy is exchanged with uh, whatever apparatus I'm using to be able to measure that qubit with. Uh, and so, and so, what we find is that I can't use that kind of measurement as my uh, as my engine type operation. That won't work. And the reason that is is simply because uh, when the when the interaction Hamiltonian that couples my meter to my system commutes with the Hamiltonian of the system, a so-called quantum non-demolition measurement. Uh, th then, then everything commutes, and so there's also so there's no uh, energy change. So it leaves the, also the average energy of the qubit uh, the same. So I, I may project into E or I may project into G, but if I average those results with the probabilities of finding those outcomes, <coughs> I find the average energy remains the same as it did before. Okay, so what I need to do instead is measure in some kind of tilted basis. And so one choice would be in this plus or minus basis. So that's my tilted basis. Uh, and then what I can do with that is uh, th that will indeed not commute with the system Hamiltonian. So I'll be able to either take or, or give energy to the system. And so we're gonna use that as our uh, operation. And so here is the cycle that I'm going to be th thinking about. So we prepare some state psi. We measure in the plus minus basis, <coughs> which changes the energy. 
we reset the state conditionally with a control pulse. Now, what I mean by that is if I, I now, according to the postulates of quantum mechanics, if I measure in the plus minus basis, I can only get plus or minus. So if I look at that, if I look at that system, quantum mechanics can only return those possible uh, results to me. And so what I want to do is if it's in, if it's in the state plus, I want to then apply a rabbi tone to this qubit with say with, with an electromagnetic field that's tuned whose frequency is tuned to the transition energy and be able to tilt that vector uh, plus back up to where I started. But what you see then is that if on, on the other hand, if I had this other result minus and I applied and I applied that same Rabi tone, I wouldn't prepare a psi, I'd prepare the state down here, which is orthogonal to psi. So that's no good. So I have to then be able to uh, uh, apply a different tone to be able to rotate me back over here if I'm in state minus. So in other words, I need some kind of conditional operation and, that, and that's important. So if I apply that conditional operation and then I repeat, then that's, that forms the engine cycle uh, in the system and I can repeat that indefinitely, okay? So, um, good. So the simplest example of this is imagine we have psi being in the ground state G. So if, the, if it's in the ground state G, then obviously if I measure it in the EG basis, I always find G, so it's very boring, nothing happens, I just get G, 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 and, and it just, uh, nothing nothing interesting happens. But if I measure in this plus minus basis, you see that no matter which one I get, if I get either plus or minus, the energy of the qubit must rise. It must go up from epsilon or energy is zero to epsilon is energy E over two for both of, epsilon over two for both of those options. And so then I can then uh, take that energy and then extract it conditionally with, 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 a, with a tone to extract that energy and bring it back down to the ground state. Okay. So that's the basic idea. It's, it's, it's a simple idea and I like it uh, very much. So this was published uh, a few years ago in, in 2017. Um, and there are some subtleties with this, right? So, so one, I already mentioned that the control pulse has to be different depending on the outcome. The other one is that the memory should be erased. Uh, it, this is similar to the Szilard engine. If I have a, if I have a type of Szilard engine, that in order to not to violate the second law of thermodynamics, we have to erase the the memory of the observer, a la you know Landau or Bennett. Uh, or, or in a, in a bunch of other work along those lines. Um, so that actually reminds me, uh, the, 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 one of the one of the things. Um, so speaking of Landau erasure, I, I wrote a paper recently in a in a magazine I write for. It's called it's called Inference. Um, it's it's a it's an international science magazine published out of Paris, and I know I know the uh, editors a little bit. And so they actually, they asked me to be on the editorial board of this magazine. Uh, so, so, so I am an editorial board member of Inference. Uh, and, and so that, but so that means I kind of pay attention. I'll have to pay attention a little bit more to what gets published. So there was a paper by a guy named John Norton, who called, uh, who has written this number of papers, sort of criticizing Landauer's principle. But anyway, he published a paper in Inference, and I and I felt since I since I was on the editorial board. And since I actually know a little bit about thermodynamics, I should write an article about it. And so he was criticizing Landauer's principle. So I wrote a paper defending it, and it's kind of a fun exchange. And we tried really hard to understand what he was saying. So his article is called A Hot Mess. Uh, and, and my article in Rejoinder, together with my student Trinoth, uh, is titled Some Like It Hot. Uh, so, so, so if you liked or interested in that debate, I encourage you to go to Inference and check it out. And you can see uh, if Jordan is is full of it, or maybe I have a good point. And and if you want to write a letter to the editor too about that, uh, you you go right ahead. So so, so that's sort of a, a little aside here, thinking about uh, Landau eraser as I was talking about this. Anyway, so so back so back to this. Um, Right. Uh, yes. So this is the other some other subtleties. And then the third subtlety is that um, there is actually a case in which I don't have to do conditional operations. The idea is that if I have if I have the state psi being just below, say, this state plus over here with very, some very small angle, <clears throat> then what you see is every time you measure in plus, it's all or in the plus minus basis, it's almost always plus because of the large overlap. 
Uh, but then, and then the rotation angle is very, very small, and so, uh, and so basically you never have to look, or, or, or basically almost never have to look, because you're almost always guaranteed to project into plus, so this is a so-called Zeno limit, where you don't have to uh, do conditional operations. So, so there are some other subtleties there, but let, let's, let's leave that now. I think we've got the point of this one. Let's go to another, uh, another example. Okay, so another example uh, is, is this paper that, that, that I like a lot. Uh, so we published this in 2018 with Cyril. Uh, and the idea now is to design uh, very efficient measurement engines that, that, that can be operating from this, from this principle. Uh, and, and Science Magazine described it uh, as uh, a, how, it, how quantum measurements can, can power a tiny hyper-efficient engine. Okay, and so we want to try to use the measurement as a source of energy to drive it. So how does it work? Um, so the idea is that here are two realizations of it. So, so one is a single atom elevator, right, where I have an elevator and I press the up button and my task is to raise the, uh, the atom from the, the ground floor to the top floor. Another version of that is on the right here. It's a single electron battery where I have to charge a capacitor one electron at a time by pulling by pulling uh, an electron from 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 one side of the plates to the other. And the idea is to try to fuel this these engines with a measurement pr a process and, and a feedback. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Um, so the idea is that for the elevator, we have a platform and we have it over pulleys. So this is a little bit steampunk here, I guess you could say. Uh, we have an atom and we have a counterweight. And so the idea is the counterweight exactly balances the platform. So if you didn't have the atom there, you could you could move this up or down with a dynamo and be able to uh, and be able to uh, do this without any energy expended. But now we're going to put a tiny little atom on the elevator. And we want to then lift it up several floors uh, using uh, using only measurement power. Now, of course, one way to do that, I could just reach over there on my counterweight and pull it. But then, of course, I have to do some work, which is mgh, where ma m is the mass of the uh, atom and h is the height that I raise it. And I don't want to do that. I want to try to then I, I want to try to lift this atom without expending any work by the operator. But having only the measurement, so to speak, do the work for me. <clears throat> so how does it work? So the idea is that we're going to have some detector to try to tell us where the atom is. And the idea is that this detector will tell us uh, sort of a binary type information. Uh, where is the atom? Is the atom close to the, the bottom of the platform? or is the atom far away from the bottom of the platform? So this is the acceleration due to gravity pulling it down, okay? And we might do this, for example, with some, uh, do this optically. You might have a light that's being transitioned, uh, shot from some laser and a detector, and if there is some transition or there or there's some phase shift, then we know it's close, and if not, then we know it's far away. So I'll get more into that in a little bit. And we know from quantum mechanics that if the detector tells us, no, the atom's not there, then we have to distort the wave function of the electron. So, so the, the, the wave function is concentrated ab above the lamp, ab above that path of the light. Uh, and then what we find then uh, is that if we know, for example, the atom is not close to the platform, then we can lift that platform uh, without doing any work on it because the atom is not close to it. And so therefore I can lift it and, and nothing is pushing, uh, pushing against it. So it uh, can be done free of energy. And so that's the basic idea. We're going to look and see if the atom is close. If it's not close, we use our counterweight to pull the, the, the elevator up by that small some small distance. And then I look and stop and think about that and say, aha, now I see the atom can be sitting at a higher point on this uh, elevator. But I've, so therefore I must have done work on this uh, atom, and so I've extracted work. I've somehow been able to extract the work from this measurement process, okay? So this is great, I've extracted work. But now there's a, there's a catch though, because sometimes uh, I might find the atom is very close to the platform. And then of course, if I tried to do, if I, if I tried to lift it, then I'd be lifting the atom, uh, so to speak. I, I have to play my MGH, and I don't wanna do that. So then my, my answer then when that happens, when that outcome happens, I just wait. Okay, so I just let it relax. 
And then if any distortion happened to the wave function, eventually it co couples to some to the, the light field and some emits some, some, some photons, and then is restored back to the uh, to the ground state. All right. So now suppose how we try to implement that. If I try to have a textbook kind of projective measurement, where I put a projector on some region zero to x, and a number, another projector on say a, a, a position epsilon to infinity, what you find there is that if you look at the wave functions after that projection measurement takes place, at this point where the interface happens, there is gonna be a very sharp kink. So, 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 so the one wave function will look something like this, the other wave function will look something like this, once I renormalize it, but this very sharp kink here at epsilon actually cause, causes an infinite energy cost. So that's no good because I have to pay an infinite amount of energy to implement that measurement. So even though my textbook quantum mechanics tells me I can do it, <coughs> uh, the energetics of the problem says, no, no, you can't do that. That's a forbidden measurement. So is there a way to get around that? Can we, can we try to do this uh, in a more gentle way? Okay, and so one of the things I've worked a lot on over my career has been uh, ways of trying to think about gentle measurements or weak measurements. And so here is a scheme that, that uses a softened measurement. So the idea is that we still have two outcomes of my detector. So rather than being inside or outside some epsilon, we kind of give a third possibility. We have inside uh, uh, from zero to epsilon, we have kind of a gray region or an uncertain region from epsilon to epsilon plus w, and then a, again a certain region from double epsilon plus w to infinity. Uh, and so what we do is we have not a projector, not a projector, but a generalized position measurement. Okay, so this is a two outcome POVM, <clears throat> and it's described with some measurement operator. So it's an inside measurement operator and an outside measurement operator. And the way I've designed it here is I've designed it such that the outside measurement operator takes a value zero from zero to epsilon. It has a smooth ramp up. I've chosen a sine function here. It turns out the sine and the cosine are really nice for the mathematics of this problem. <coughs> and then over here, it has the value one. Okay, and this, so similarly, the mi would be the square root of one minus m zero uh, squared. So it has this kind of shape uh, to the measurement. So what I'm doing now is I'm doing this designer measurement in order to uh, try to have an efficient quantum engine. All right, so what happens? Um, so in order to do this designer measurement, I have to ask, what do I want to optimize? And so if I want to optimize, for example, um, uh, if I want to have, if I want to optimize, uh, so, so there, there's no wasted energy, right? So that would mean in the relaxation step, I don't have to give up any photons to the environment. Then what I want to have is the state finding, uh, the, uh, the, after the finding, the outside result is actually the new ground state corresponding to the shifted position of the wall. So in other words, after I make this outside measurement, you see I have this region of zero between zero and epsilon. And what I want to do is I want to take this wall, the, this, the, the, this is the bottom of the platform, and I want to advance it a distance epsilon. Okay, so when I do that, if I want to do that, I want to make sure then to have an efficient engine, I want to have that the next engine cycle, remember, so I'm starting with the ground state for simplicity. So this blue line, this blue curve is the ground state of the wave function. Uh, this is an airy function for the, for the bouncing ball problem. What I want is that when the wall is advanced by some distance epsilon, the airy function just gets displaced by the distance epsilon. And then I know I'm in the next uh, engine cycle state. Okay, so then I can then go up, 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 up in this elevator by, by repeating this procedure over and over again. So I'd like to have that be one of my conditions. Uh, and then what happens if I fail? What I'd like to have is that the state of finding the after the result i is the initial ground state. So if I fail, if I find it's, uh, it's basically, uh, if it's in the inside region, I'd like to arrange it so that I don't disturb this ground state very much. It has basically is the same form. So then I leave it, I leave it the same. So it stays in the ground state the whole time, either it's shifted or not shifted. This would be the best case scenario. Okay, uh, and so if I do this optimization, what I find is actually quite interesting. Uh, how can I reach this? So this would be the, the uh, when I reach optimal efficiency, so I don't waste any energy. 
I, I, I have a really good accounting for my energy. What I find is that this epsilon in the in the characteristic units of this bouncing ball problem is of order one. It's about 1.1 1 .1 in, in these units. But the gray region, how big is the gray region, is really, really big. So I have a very, very large gray region and a sort of a, 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 in, a in a region here from zero to epsilon being of order one in the characteristic units. Okay, so that's a little bit surprising. You might think you want epsilon being very, very small, but that's not true. And so indeed, if you if I plot those two things, if I plot either the displaced ground state or the initial ground state for these choices of parameters, well, I, and, I, and I compare it with the displaced area function or a non-displaced area function, it's actually really, really close. You see, it's amazing how close it is uh, to, to this, uh, this displaced ground state. Okay, so this is the best case you can do with this kind of measurement. So let's look a little bit at some of the uh, results then from this. So I, we can plot the work uh, that you get out of this engine. You can also plot the efficiency. And what you find is there is a trade-off. So, so the optimal efficiency is at this point epsilon is 1 when W is really big. So that's up here. <clears throat> that's the best efficiency. But the best work is actually where you have W very, being very, very small. So a very, very small um, uh, gray region. But you have uh, also epsilon of order 1. Uh, and that's going to be the, the best work you get. So, but in that, in that case, you see over here, you have very bad efficiency because you have to throw away a lot of energy because of that kink in the wave function I was talking about before. And so if I plot, uh, yeah, so if I plot uh, uh, energy versus efficiency along this dotted line, I get this curve over here showing the trade-off between the two. Okay, so the work is in the characteristic energy scale of this bouncing ball problem, which is related to the force you're applying from the, say, the gravitational electrical potential in the problem. Okay, um, so we can also then look at very detailed analysis of the uh, energetics of this problem. So if we're looking at the interaction, uh, how might you implement this generalized measurement? That's one, one way of asking. So here's a possible implementation. You have, a, say, a, 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 say, a photon that comes by <coughs> that has a polarization involved. So the polarization could be a two-outcome two uh, result characterized by a polymatrix in the simple model, uh, impulsive interaction. And, and what you find is that if you have a two-level system interacting with this particle in, in the uh, gravitational potential, you have this kind of post-measurement state. And if I choose this F function here to be a phase ramp, where it goes from zero, at zero at, up to epsilon, it increases linearly up to epsilon plus W, and then constant as uh, the value of pi over two after that, this kind of phase ramp on the uh, interaction between the photon and the uh, and the particle in the well does a really nice job uh, of then of implementing that generalized measurement I was talking about before. Okay, uh, and so we can also look at the energetics. How much energy do you have to happens when you have this detector? So if you have the detector in the system, looking at the energetics between this, obviously we, we're getting work out. We're also in principle wasting some energy with the relaxation step. And so the energetics, then we have to then energize our meter. Okay, so you can show explicitly then that when this energy, when this uh, interaction is successful, where I can raise this atom, then uh, then I also have to uh, I also have to then lose energy from my meter, so I have to re-energize it. Okay, so let me go on now. Um, so I want to give another quick example, and I love this example because it's so simple, which is the it's the atom in the piston. Okay, so it's a similar kind of thing. I prepare the atom in the ground state, and, and it's funny because you know I've been teaching my students uh, this stuff in, in in I think sophomore level or second year university quantum mechanics now. Of course, all online, right? So I'm sitting here in my in my home office, the same place I'm talking to you at right now, writing on my iPad and talking into my microphone and drawing pictures of these particles in a box to tell them how quantum mechanics works. And so it's sort of a delight to be able to use this elementary physics here to, 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 uh, to talk about some of this, uh, another example. So in this case, uh, the idea is that we have a piston. We have an atom in the ground state. So it's in this, in this uh, lowest energy state. So this is really in the deep quantum regime. And then I do a measurement to see if the atom is close to the piston or not. Okay, And if it's close to the piston, I don't do anything. But if it's far away, I and then quickly push the piston in. But unlike the elevator where I can keep going up, 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 what I can do now is I can have an adiabatic step where I very gradually pull the piston out 
and extract the energy where I adiabatically, by the adiabatic theorem, I go from the, the inserted piston ground state uh, to the uh, pulled out piston ground state to be able to extract that energy uh, adiabatically. Okay, and, and of course, uh, along with this, you know, there, there are these really nice works about shortcuts to adiabaticity that people have talked about. So Ronnie, ta Ronnie Kozlov talked about this as well, and other people have been talking about this. And so that, those kind of tricks could also be a, in play here to improve power in this engine as well. Okay, great. Um, uh, Indeed. So this is another simple example, and it's easy to work out it's because the, the mathematics is quite simple. It's easy to work out dissipated heat work efficiency. In this example, I chose it to be a little different. I w didn't want to maximize the efficiency. I chose the measurements in this example to be such that if I get the successful event, that corresponds to all the work in, in the system. So I can do exactly get all the work out from the success, success, successful event. But the fail event, I can then choose that to be the event where I have all of the wasted energy. So I can then separate the work and heat exactly by quantum measurement outcomes, which I thought was a nice, a nice feature as well. So there you see the efficiency goes up to only about 0.8 in this example. But uh, what's interesting also, with where is the, what the average work is, how do you, the average work is maximized a little less than half. To get the maximum efficiency, actually, it turns out to push the, the best strategy is to push the piston all the way in, and then you get the, the maximum uh, efficiency. <coughs> okay, so another example. What about unread measurements? Can we have a, if, can we think about this measurement engine as a kind of effective hot bath? So I, now I want to do the measurement, but not do any kind of feedback, just, just sort of ignore it and do it over and over again. So there are these nice papers that pre predated ours in 2017 and 2018 uh, by Yi, Tauchner, Kim, and, and Ding, and they do something similar to this. So, so what they have is they have just, uh, they, I think they talk about both like a harmonic oscillator, but also these two-level systems where you have a four-stroke engine. So you have some adiabatic compression where you, you're you doing, basically in the simplest example, it's just a qubit. So what I can do is I can imagine changing the level structure. So I start with a small level spacing, I'm increasing it to a large level spacing and back again, where I have some have, I have a compression step, I have a measurement, unread measurement step, an expansion step, and a thermalization step. And what you can see by doing that is that the measurement sort of takes the role of a very hot bath there in this uh, four-stroke cycle. And it turns out that the physics is very similar to an auto engine. So it's very similar to a kind of a quantum auto engine. And that means the efficiency then is bounded by one minus the ratio of these uh, two energy levels. Okay. Uh, so, so, so we were kind of inspired by this. This is a nice uh, thing in, in saying, can, can, we, can we do a better job of this unread measurement? Can we try to redesign this so I have, uh, so I have only unconditional operations? And what you see is that there are no coherent processes that are used here. Uh, and so what we can do is we can add in some coherent steps. And so now the idea is that we start with some kind of coherent st uh, thermal state. That's it. And then we have a step one where we do a coherent rotation up to some angle. This costs us some energy. We then do unread measurements, which takes me uh, in step two uh, to this state here on, in the plus minus basis. So we're still we're doing plus minus measurement basis measurements. And then I do a reverse rotation by, mi by minus pi over two back down to here. And then, of course, th then the final step, we let it thermalize with the cold bath to then come back to row zero. So this is a combination of using measurement and a cold bath to be able to do a four-stroke engine cycle. And, and this would, and here, just to putting my money where my mouth is, we published this in my journal here, Quantum Studies, with Alexia and Cyril just, just a, a few months ago. And what's nice about this is that you can then have the, the work extracted versus the efficiency as a function of this angle theta that I used over here, this green arrow. And what you find is that you can have maximal work extraction at pi over four, but then you can also get the perfect efficiency at pi over two. But maybe it's not so exciting simply because when, you, when you're at pi over two, that means there's no work and there's no heat. Uh, so there we go. Okay, and, and I was also briefly mentioning we can also do a three-stroke cycle where you measure in some tilted basis, you have a coherent tone and then thermalize, uh, but the efficiency is not as good as this four-stroke cycle. Okay, so in my last uh, five minutes or so, I want to talk about something a little bit more exotic. Um, and the little bit more exotic paper is something that I'm really tickled by. I think it's a really nice uh, physical example. 
And this is a paper I published. Uh, I, I should not say published. This is a paper we have on the archive with Cyril, uh, Kai Wagel, and Benjamin Yuar. Uh, and we call it kind of maybe a controversial title. We call it Spooky Work at a Distance, an Interaction-Free Quantum Measurement-Driven Engine. All right, so, so to, to, this is to be a little bit provocative, the question is the following. <clears throat> Can, if we have the world's most sensitive bomb, so sensitive that it would blow up if I touched it, am I able to lift that bomb without blowing it up? Okay, so this is the question that, that, that we have. Uh, and you might say, Andrew, um, this archive paper reads, you published, posted this about a year ago, so why isn't this paper published? And we thought maybe it was just because the journal we submitted it to was being lazy, and so I wrote them an angry email a few days ago saying, what's, what's going on with my paper? And then I got back this kind of funny reply. So far, so far, your article has been sent to 18 reviewers, none of which has ended up providing a report. So we keep trying. Okay, so, so hopefully if you get the, I'm going to explain this physics to you. So hopefully if you get this paper, you'll be able to understand it. And I think the reason why uh, nobody, e either, either they're being really polite to me or, or they're saying, Andrew, you've lost your marbles. But I think really the real reason why is it's become it's, it's combining several different fields of physics that are not usually combined, right? So it's combining topics of quantum foundations together with this measurement engine, com together with thermodynamics, and so it's a really kind of unusual combination of topics. Okay, um, so uh, so here is the idea. So let me introduce it to you, and I'll try to be brief here. The idea is this concept of interaction-free measurements. So, so a number of years ago, uh, Illitzer and Weidman had this great idea. They said, let's take the world's most sensitive bomb and put it in a very simple interferometer, a Mach Zender interferometer, and we have to decide a question. Is, is the world's most sensitive bomb there in the interferometer, or is it not there? Okay. And what we do is we tune the interferometer such that I have two possible outputs. I put a photon in A, a single photon, and then I either measure it in D or C. And if the bomb is not there, I tune it such that the interferometer always comes out D and never C. So we call D the bright port, C the dark port. And then the idea is that if the bomb is there, then there are three possible things that can happen. All right, or really in, any, in an experiment, there are three possible events. One is that the bomb explodes and the, and the experiment is done. B, or A, B, B is the port D, the bright port can fire, or C, the, the dark port C can click. Now, here's the nice thing. If the dark port C clicks, we infer that the bomb had to be there. The bomb had to be there, otherwise uh, D would have fired. And furthermore, uh, it, because it didn't explode, we've been able to detect its existence without blowing it up. So the conclusion is, the conclusion from quantum mechanics, is that if the dark port C fires, the bomb must have been in the interferometer. In the interferometer. So we can detect it's there without blowing it up. Okay. Now, to go a little bit further, we have to give some kind of interpretation, but it's a reasonable interpretation. If we retrodict about the past, we say the photon, if, if uh, C clicks, must have gone through the upper arm, the arm with no bomb in it, otherwise the bomb would have exploded. Uh, and so, the, therefore, the bomb must have blocked the other path. All right? So there's no way the, bomb, the photon can get through, and so the photon must have taken the upper path. That seems a very un uncontroversial uh, uh, conclusion. Okay. So we want to we make like, a twist on this. And so the twist is we want to try to do what we call spooky work on the bomb. And the idea is we want to put the bomb, we want to get a quantum bomb, and so we're going to let the bomb have so many internal degrees of freedom to let, let it blow up, but it also has some kind of orbital degree of freedom, so it can be in or out, uh, it can go up or down, uh, and it can be lifted, in principle, against the force of gravity. So we put it in a gravitational field, and we want to try to be able to lift this, this bomb up, okay? And so uh, if the bomb, so, so, so how, is it, how is it going to work? Um, so we're going to have it, again, be in the ground state wave function of this orbital degree of freedom, just like we had for the, for the elevator. And we arrange the photon to pass by. There's going to be some local interaction if the atom extends into the photon's path. Otherwise, there's not. And everything else is treated as a zero degree, uh, zero temperature open quantum system. And we give a lot of math to justify this stuff in our paper. So here's the idea. Uh, we, what we're going to do is we're going to post-select on instances where the dark port clicks. And if the dark port clicks, 
then we can then, then the inference is the bomb must have been inside the interferometer, otherwise it wouldn't have clicked. So that's un uncontroversial. Second, it did not explode when we post-select on this dark port firing. Therefore, the bomb's position must be localized inside the interferometer. So, so it must be have that event where I localize it inside the interferometer, but that is against the force of gravity, so it has higher energy than it started with. And so the question I want to pose to you is, where did the energy come from? Right? So it seems uncontroversial. Somehow it must have come from the meter, which is the photon itself. Uh, and in this case, it's the photon. Right? Uh, but we just argued in the previous slide that the photon must have passed through the other path in order to not blow up the bomb, or, or did it? Okay, so, so, the, so the, the tension is the bomb didn't explode, the bomb gets lifted, but the photon went on the other path. So it seems like somehow the photon was able to raise the bomb while not while going on a path that, that can be miles apart from it. So that's that's the interesting uh, twist. Okay, and so if we do the explicit calculation, what we see is that there's no there is energy balance. There's no energy created or destroyed. All right, so then we have this little interesting little trilemma of interpretation that somehow the energy was non-locally given to the to the bomb from the photon. Maybe it was, maybe the retrodictive inference is false, that somehow went, something went wrong with that retrodiction. Or three, somehow maybe there's some kind of virtual uh, energy trans transition uh, given to the bomb uh, locally, but then interfering it with itself somehow in some kind of uh, uh, virtual way. All right, so, so there are some different interpretations, but regardless of the interpretation is, the, the claim is we can lift the world's most sensitive bomb without uh, blowing it up. All right, so I think that's uh, enough for, for today. So I just wanna conclude, we had some uh, light banter about quarantine cabin fever. Uh, told you about my, uh, my, my view from my snowy window. Uh, talked about some quantum thermal machines, and I gave you my wish list for, for I, I, I love this field of quantum thermodynamics, but at least I want a portion of the field to be thinking more and more about fully quantum resources, uh, where we talk about quantum energetics and not just quantum thermodynamics. And then talked about there are various species of these quantum measurement engines we've invented, and we're not done yet. Uh, we, we're just ramping up on this, and so we're, we're, we're inventing engines like crazy, and so there are more on the way. I just also wanted to thank my group here. So, so, so I haven't seen my group in a long time. I kind of miss them. So here they all are uh, in my office hanging out, having a group meeting before we were forbidden from talking to each other in person. Uh, so that's all I have to say for today. And so why don't we, I stop talking now. And if you have questions or, or comments or uh, personal attacks, I, I'm happy to listen to those too. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, Right, so yeah, we'll take questions now. Um, there's a little bit of a delay, so let me just uh, bring my video back in so you can see me. Um, yeah, there's usually a bit of a delay, so we'll have to wait a little bit to, to get some questions in. Um, I can already relay um, a comment from John, which I second, actually. I mean, thanks very, very much for uh, the set of references at the beginning and just for giving a very pedagogical and nice talk in general. But um, we'll definitely be looking at those references from, from the beginning uh, a, a lot more closely in our group. Um, so maybe I can kick off with a question that I was just wondering about. Um, you find... I mean, you showed a few different engines, of course, like several, um, and the efficiency characteristics seem to vary a bit, right? So in, in some cases, you were able to reach efficiency one. In some cases, that you were not, right? Um, if that's correct. So I was just wondering, um, do you think there is some kind of underlying principle determining w which of these engines are able to reach efficiency one and, and not? I mean, is there some kind of Carnot-like bound that would apply to these measurement engines? Yeah, this is a great question, Mark. Um, so, so, so first of all, you, you know, it's funny because you know when we're dealing with the quantum thermal cases, I mentioned at the beginning. You know, we do this and we do that. We had some nice quantum design, and what we ended up getting was we get Carnot efficiency, Carnot efficiency, Carnot efficiency, and so. Um, 
and there are, you know, people work like crazy, you know, introduce coherence, introduce entanglement to try to get around this. And it's, and it's really hard to do when you have thermal resources, right? You have to have some kind of really, really subtle trickery to do anything besides Carnot efficiency. So what's nice about these quantum measurement engines is that there's no thermal baths we're working with, except for maybe one thermal bath. So we're dealing with an ord ordered state of energy. So in principle, there's nothing to stop you from reaching unit efficiency, right? And so I mentioned this a little bit in the talk, but let me just sort of uh, elaborate a little bit on it, which is the fact that um, in order to to not uh, to reach efficiency, you can't waste energy. So that's the underlying things. So remember, I talked about in these in these different protocols, there was usually at least two outcomes of these uh, uh, events. There was a successful outcome and a fail outcome. And the successful one allowed us to ratchet up the work. You know, the elevator went up. And then the fail one uh, said, basically, we can't do anything. We just have to wait and, and reset. Okay. And so what we find is that when you, in, in those fail outcomes, you're going to waste energy by dumping energy, for example, in this elevator to, for example, to, to the photon bath. So it's assume zero temperature photon environment takes away and resets you to the ground state. And what you want to do is you want to try to minimize that loss. So, so, the, so, the, so, so if you can minimize it, and so in this case, it, we had we had a situation where either you keep the ground state wave function, for example, the same, or you just shift the ground state wave function in this engine. That would be the best case scenario, right? And so what we find even for the elevator engine, we don't get quite to one, we get something like to 0.998 efficiency, something like that, if we optimize the parameters of this of this problem. So, so the recipe is uh, you can get perfect efficiency, just don't waste any energy. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I think we... Ah, okay, so someone had the same question. Um, don't be afraid to ask more questions, guys, because <laughs> this is your chance. Um, so maybe let's just wait a little bit and see if some more some more come in. There's lots of clapping, by the way. Uh, virtual oh, good. Clapping. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the class. <laughs> I miss you all. I, I, hope to see, I hope to see you at some of these non-canceled conferences here in the, in the uh, hopefully near future. Ah, okay, so here we have a question from our own Giacomo Guarnieri. Um, so he says, hi, Andrew, thanks for the talk. Did you characterize the fluctuations of the extracted work? How do the different types of measurements affect the engine constancy, i.e. its signal-to-noise ratio? Oh yeah, this is a great question, right? So the, the, yeah, we should. These are noisy engines, right? So 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 there are a lot of fluctuations in the engines, and, and so what 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 I was interested. So this so this is something we need to do more research on. But indeed, what when I use when I characterize the engine performances, the work, the efficiency, the the, the amount of heat taken from the measurement, we always calculated average quantities. And this is because it's easy to cheat with this kind of thing, right? So I, I, I can have a very lucky engine, for example, right? right? Well, if I have my elevator and I get success, 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 I go up, 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 up. And then I, if I get lucky, then I can have, uh, you know, I, I, I'm extracting energy like crazy uh, and doing lots of work, right? Um, and, and so, uh, but, but you're right. There is a lot of fluctuations in the problem. Uh, and so we, we have done some initial look, looking into the, uh, you know, the, the, the variance of these quantities, but it's something that we're, we're still working on. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Yeah, it seems like a really interesting uh, thing to look into further. Um, so we have a question from Karen. Uh, is there any way to look at the power in these settings? Yes, indeed. Yes. So, so, so we have, yeah, so we have it, uh, so we, so we discussed a little bit about power in our PRL and I think we discussed it in some other, uh, some, another work or two, but, uh, so, so one of the one of the points where the power becomes interesting is is when you think about how long do you have to wait to reset. So, okay, so so if you do if you do this dissipative resetting, then the the next cycle time you're bounded by how much relaxation you have in the system before you can cycle again. So that sets sets the time scale on which you can extract energy. So that sets the power on the problem. But there are other limits where, for example, if I imagine I have uh, in my elevator, if I make my epsilon really, really, really small, then I get a work that goes to zero in that limit. But because it's very, a very small measure, it's a very small epsilon, 
I don't have to reset, right? Basically, the wave function is only slightly changed, and so I don't have to reset, and so then I can I can then immediately uh, do this again. Okay, so so what in that limit? That's sort of a Zeno limit, where you can have even though the work goes to zero, the power remains finite because uh, because I'm I'm being able to do this immediately over and over and over again. So we looked a little bit at the power in that kind of limit. Um, but generally, I mean, I think we've, we've been thinking about morally about these discrete cycles where you have sort of a, a, a cycle, you know, step one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. But I think in the, in the future, we're looking also into more into these continuous engines where you have a continuous measurement process. And there, I think the issue of power will then be set by, for example, the characteristic measurement time of your weak measurement or whatever you have. So that's something we're also thinking about in terms of uh, leveraging some of our work and continuous measurements to apply to these, to these engines as well. Great, thanks. Um, maybe I can just ask a follow-up question, which is kind of connected to the talk we had earlier this week. I mean, do you think your conclusions regarding the conclusions regarding power would also hold if you take into account the time taken to kind of reset the measuring device? Because you you mentioned that there's this kind of Landauer cost as well. Does right, that get right. Yeah, in yeah, so that, that's that's a good question too. But but I think also. I think those can be done at two different time scales, right? I, I, as long as you give yourself some memory in the system, I don't think you have to, you know, you don't have to tie the erasure of your memory with the operation of the engine. Those can be done on different time scales. I don't see, I don't see any reason why those have to be done concurrently. Yeah, I, I agree with you actually. Yeah, so I don't think that's a limiting factor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so we have another question from Namrata Shukla. Um, thanks for the nice talk, Andrew. Are there any analytic expressions for power and efficiency to see and think about the trade-off between them. Yes, absolutely, and they're all they're certainly in my paper. So, let, so let me maybe I can even. Uh, yeah, I'm still showing my screen. Yes, yeah. so I, I didn't give them here simply because I wanted to give you more of the idea uh, of of the of the talk. But if you go to to, to this talk to this paper here, PRL uh, 2018. We have we have uh, nice expressions uh, using the, the you know the area function wave function of the uh, of the particle the bouncing bar the bouncing ball uh, problem, and we can then write exp explicitly down uh, how much work you get out right. So it's actually very simple. The work you get out is simply mg epsilon times the probability that you get a successful result. So that's a very simple expression for the work. Uh, for the heat, uh, it, it, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's actually a very simple, relatively simple analytic expression involving uh, how much uh, energy. Because what you can do in the calculation is is you can think about how is the wave function disturbed under the measurement process, and the, and quantum mechanics predicts that for you. So then you can then calculate how much average energy is there for that disturbed wave function and then say, how does that differ from what I started with, right? So that must be the energy that I gained in this process. And so that's also a relatively straightforward expression. And so, and so in those expressions or in the uh, choice that I gave for this measurement outcome, this guy. So for this guy, this, this, this sine expression, so we give a general expression for how much uh, basically heat is dissipated in the process. But for this for this particular choice, it becomes quite straightforward to write down, and so then they're then they're relatively simple analytic expressions. I didn't want to get into the technical details uh, in in the talk, but, I, but if you want to learn a little bit more about it, I encourage you to take a look at the paper. Great, thanks very much. Um, and uh, yeah, we have another question um, from Prasanna Venkatesh. Um, so, do you think if if one includes energetics of the apparatus explicitly, we would get back to the usual Carnot limits in measurement engines, i.e., do these results depend on where we place the Heisenberg cut? Yeah, yeah. No, yes, so this is a great question. It's something that that, that, that also was was, a, was an issue in uh, Marcus Uber's talk uh, earlier this week. Um, and and this, is, this is the question essentially, what would you take as your resources, right? What is your resource definition? What is given to you to begin doing the analysis? And in thermodynamics, the resources is, I, I, I give to you for free some hot bath and some cold bath, and then you've got to do some analysis with that. But nobody told you how you got your hot bath and your cold bath, right? In, in a steam engine, you've got to burn some coal or, or something like this, right? This, th 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 this comes from somewhere. 
right? So I view it as a similar way. It's basically what you take as your resource to begin doing the analysis. And I think what's sensible for this quantum energetics field is to take as your resource the 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 the, the type of things you, you have in a quantum mechanics textbook. So you have unitary operations, you have state preparations, you have measurements, you have dissipation, you have Lindladians and things like that. But certainly I think if, if you say, I'm going to think about the apparatus uh, as a thermodynamic system, right? And then trying to prepare that, prepare the fiducial state of your apparatus, then certainly I think it makes sense to say that th then, then the, th the sort of usual thermodynamic laws are going to be uh, instrumental in, in determining those bounds. So I think, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable point of view. Right, but as you've said already, you kind of want to get away from that point of view, so it, it makes complete sense. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. Yeah, so that's my that's my my message to to the community that's listening is I want to try to think about fully quantum resources, if, if, if at least as a subfield of this of this endeavor. Great, thanks very much. Uh, that's really interesting. So. Um, I think that's probably it for all the questions, so maybe we can wrap it up there. I'll just say thank you so much again, Andrew, that was really a great talk. Um, thanks a lot for joining us, um, and thanks to everybody out there who, who tuned in and, and participated. Thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Goodbye, everyone. Stay safe and healthy and sane. Bye-bye. <laughs>